was uh, just a little kid on the weekends and uh, any time that there was an activity, my parents uh, packed me and my sister in the car and uh, drove us around and we picked antiques. So I got the antique bug and collecting bug uh, very, at a very young age. And I didn't do a whole lot with that for a long time uh, until we moved up here and my parents, uh, well, they opened a, a couple different antique stores up here before they retired. Um, when I was younger though, uh, we went to an auction and my dad left me alone and we were getting ready to open our first antique shop. and. Um, he left me alone at the auction downstairs, and he went upstairs, and he come, he came back, and I said, Dad, I bought something. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, I won an auction. You know, and I bought a, a stove, a cook stove, for $3. Oh. Obviously, because nobody else wanted it. And uh, we took it home and uh, just spit polished it up, you know. And, and the day that we opened our antique shop, the first thing that sold when I was 10 years old was um, that stove for $30. Yeah. So, you know, I made a, whatever, a thousand percent profit or whatever it is, you know, and I was kind of hooked. And what I realized after I was an adult and, and moved up here after mom and dad had, is that I had soaked up all this knowledge. And so I could look at old things and know a sort of a, a ballpark value where I could know if they were old or if they've been restored or if there was any value there at all or whatever. You know, I kind of soaked that stuff up. And I also realized that I really liked that kind of thing. If you uh, happen to watch TV and you watch Minnesota Pickers, you know, or uh, that's what I am. If you watch American Pickers on TV, you, uh, you'll see a lot of times they talk about the thrill is just the thrill of finding something. Uh, and really, that's all it is. You know, and everybody can touch on that in some way, even if you don't like old things and you like to go shopping or you like bookstores or, you know, if you're looking and you're looking and you just want to find that one thing that touches you in some way. So that's how I got into all this. Today I want to talk about a few different things. I want to I got way too many slides, so I may at some point just let it run through and while I'm talking you can look at things, but I want to talk about the sport of, of uh, dark house spearfishing and just so you know some of its history and can know that in Minnesota uh, we're one of only four or five states that still allow this sport. Um, obviously there's a limited amount of states that have water that freezes over that you can even participate in the sport. Uh, it's not a southern sport uh, for obvious reasons. Um, it has a lot of history. I, I don't think anybody is really positive who came up with the idea. It certainly probably uh, was initiated by Inuit or by uh, North American Indians, uh, by the same uh, type of people over in uh, Europe and Asia at the same time. It's very old. The idea is, and I'll show you some pictures later, you go out on the ice, and it's not like regular ice fishing, you cut a large rectangular hole, probably three foot by two foot. Um, used to, they had similar implements of danger here, but this is called an ice saw. Folds up nice so you don't hurt yourself. You put the pin back in. It has a chisel tip, so really this would be the only tool you would need. Often you go ice fishing in uh, early winter when the ice is thick enough to be on, but not so thick that it takes you hours to saw through it. That being said, this can cut through a three foot block of ice. Um, I've done it before by hand, it's hard, it's tough, and when you're done, you just want to go home. <laughs> so, oftentimes I'll take an auger, I have a really fast hand auger, and I'll make four holes in the corner, maybe two more if it's really thick, 
and then I can just piece out the pieces, okay? Uh, one thing I left in the car, but you all know what that is, is ice tongs. Um, once you have that piece sawed out, you gotta get it out of the hole. And if it's really thick, it's heavy. Um, so this is flexible, and you can even go around the corners when you're going. Uh, it basically, it takes a lot of upper body strength, and you just you go like this. And um, in the early part of winter, when the ice is uh, you know, under 12 inches thick, it really cuts like butter. It's very sharp. So you have your hole. Once your hole is cut, you uh, either, you know, put your ice fishing shed that's dark on top, you know, that's dark inside, paint it all black, no windows. Um, or at least windows that you can cover up. We'll mess with this later. You, uh, Put that over the top, or you just, what I use is a pop-up. And you put that pop-up over the top, and you close up all your windows, and uh, you find a nice, comfortable thing to sit on. And what happens is sunlight goes through the ice, okay, all around you. So underneath, it's not dark. It's lit up. And you have your dark house over the top of you, and it looks like you're looking down into an aquarium. And you can see the bottom of the lake if you're shallow. You can see everything that goes on in the winter. You know, there's those rusty crayfish crawling all around. That's all they do. They're active. Um, there's perch, walleye, northern pike, crappie. All those kind of fish and all that activity, depending on where you are, are going through it. It really is like going to an aquarium and watching these fish and... For me, and anybody that likes doing this, it's really exciting. Um, it's nothing like just sitting by a hole and watching your bother, you know, which I, I think is nice in, in March when the crappie are really biting and it's fun, you know. Um, but as far as uh, patience and sitting there and watching and doing something, um, you have your decoy, which you put down the hole. Okay, I'll get into how decoys are made in a little bit, but in the air it, it uh, is supposed to sit like this. When it gets down in the water, the tail will come up and it'll sit just like a fish. When you Lower. Just singing. is because the, when they were done with those at the mine, they just threw them away, so the guys brought them home and they made perfect little lure boxes for those chop chips. You know, so uh, those of us who are strange like me, we collect those too. So 
really, it's just uh, an opportunity to uh, share with you part of Ely's history, is what I am talking about today. Um, I got into it not only from the antique side, but because I uh, decided I always wanted to carve fishing lures. And when uh, we moved up here, I started carving fishing lures. And these are, these are two of uh, the first batch that I made here, some of the first batch. Um, I'm just going to cycle through some slides. A little of me. There's always this. Uh, When you want technology to work, yeah. Okay, this is the first decoy I made. It's a rough, really rough copy of uh, a really famous carver's work. Those are plugs I made. A little mouse and a, another plug. Here's a whole group of little folk art fishing lures I made. I always took them out and tested them, and, and uh, they work great for smallmouth bass even as ridiculous as some of them look, um, bass will hit anything when they're angry at Here's a, a table when we had one of our antique stores. There's me. This is a... Uh, this style right here. I made those two lures, the one previous and that one. And uh, I showed them to my dad and he said, you know, you really should start making some decoys. Well, you know, you can carve a fishing lure in almost any shape out of anything, slap some paint on it, put some hooks on it, go outside and uh, try it on the lake, and if you try long enough, you're probably gonna catch a fish, or you have some rate of success. Well, I didn't really know anything about carving decoys. Um, it really is an art form in order to get it to swim correctly in water. Uh, you can make decoys and finish and put a lot of weight in it, do whatever you want, and take it out and it won't even sink. You know? <laughs> so you, you have to be aware of what kind of wood you're using, how you shaped it, um, where the weight is in the body, uh, what you use for weight, different things like that. So I said, well, that sounds good. I think I'm going to make some decoys. So these are the first two really fish decoys I made. And uh, then I made these turtles with fork feet. <laughs> and uh, here's one that actually, by this time, I would sort of gotten some things down. This are some lures I call three blind mice. Um, another little mouse fish decoy. You can see that I like folk art. Mixed in here are, are some old decoys that I found in, in around the Ely area about the time I started uh, making my own fish decoys. You can see just the variety of how uh, these guys used house paint and different things and glitter, uh, whatever they had uh, to incorporate into their fish to make them be attractive not only to them but you know to the fish under the water. The customer. So they're right, the customer. Yeah. <laughs> just like now, nothing's changed. You know. So you see just the extreme variety of things. The best thing. Uh, about the best feeling you can have uh, if you're somebody that does this is when you get a fish on a lure that you carve. I mean, you could go to the store and, and buy the newest, fanciest lure, but and, and you could catch fish and you could have a nice day. But if you put the time in to make a lure and actually toss it out there and something bites on it, or you get a fish to decoy in on it, it's really a, an amazing feeling. So, so you can see I'm pretty happy there. Um, again, these are just some of the old uh, fish. There's uh, one of my early fish. I made these out of dynamite boxes, and uh, they're really thin but long. There's a, a fish in, in different stages. Again, I'm going to let some of these cycle through and uh, try to keep an eye on it because there's a couple places where I want to stop, but I want to just keep talking about things. So I have 350 slides on there. <laughs> so 
Here's what a decoy starts out as. Uh, this happens to be mahogany. Um, it's really nice wood. Um, it chips a lot if you don't have a sharp knife. Usually what I use is, is a white cedar. You don't know what you're doing with cedar. It's very straight grain, so you make one too deep cut or you go too fast and it'll go all the way down straight grain and take a huge chunk out of it. Um, those are some of I told you uh, some of the interesting colors that um, Mr. Mizra from town here did, and those are some of those right there. I'll leave that as a background for now. Anyway, so this is mahogany. This is how it starts. Uh, I like longer decoys. Um, for whatever reason, luck I've had anything uh, about this length or longer, uh, I've, caught, I've <coughs> decoyed in more fish on that. If you have a, if you have a, a decoy that's you know 10 inches long. Um, it, it's not a disadvantage. I find more pipe come in for bigger decoys, I think is what I'm saying. That may just be my experience. It might not be true, but one thing is certain. If you have a 10-inch decoy, it's a little bit easier to figure out how long the fish is that's coming in. You know, If it looks like it's three times as long, it's 30-inch fish. Okay, so you have a block of wood. You have uh, Your next step is to kind of rough out uh, what the shape of the fish is you want to look like. Now, when you get these down in the water, it's more the movement, uh, the paint you choose, how it swims around, and if the pike are there and if they're hungry. So it can be the most ridiculous, crazy looking thing there is. And uh, it may not look like a fish, but they don't care. You know, it has to attract them, not necessarily people. The next thing you want to do is, is uh, pick out a position for where you want your fins to be. A lot of that ends up being experience because there has to be a balance point where your line tie goes to get this whole thing, once you've got the weight in it, to uh, hold like this when it's out of the water and go like this when it's in the water. So a lot of that has to do with experience. But then the basic thing you do is you've got to get holes in the bottom for the weight to go in in some way. And then the right way to do it is uh, you'll see that there are now uh, slots on the side and your fin goes in that slot. This is uh, what I do for uh, metal is I get most of my metal at the Ely Mall. You guys know where that is? Yeah. No. The metal pile at the dump. You know, it's free. And people throw a lot of stuff away there, not so much copper anymore, but they throw a lot of, of uh, pre-prime flashing from roofs away in little pieces because it's all just scrap. And so I've got two surfaces on that that's already primed. Um, and all I have to do is, is cut it out. And, and that thickness, that material is almost perfect for um, fish decoy bins. So I'm recycling as I go by reusing someone else's junk. Um, you have a fin, it's going to fit into 
the slots you made, you obviously have to cut it so it goes into the weight. And I'll let you guys pass this around, but the next thing you would do is you would fold up the metal in there so that it can't come out. The weight in fishing decoys often now will cover up with putty when we're done, but the weight is melted lead. Again, recycled uh, tire weights, old um, you know, lead from uh, sinkers, um, whatever. Um, and you heat it up, you melt it, you pour it in here, and when it's you know, done, it holds your fins in and it provides the weight that this fish needs to sink down into the water. Um, for this, I just chose to, to show you part of it. Um, the tail is another piece of metal. Um, I fit my tails into the fish quite a ways. And then you'll see there are two holes here as you pass it around. I don't think the metal is sharp because I took my Dremel to it in sandpaper. But um, Then you'll pin it and the tail will stay in there. You could shortcut and uh, not fold your metal over here, not put your wings into your, into your lead and just glue it and do all those kind of things. And then after your, your decoy gets in the water, if anybody ever decides to use it, it will contract and expand with the cold water and um, all those pieces will fall out. <laughs> if you make decoys out of basswood and you happen to hit it with your spear, it'll soak up water like a sponge. Basswood's a really uh, nice wood to carve with, really easy to carve with, but if you get a nick that goes through the paint or a, a cut or you drop it or ding it or anything, it really does, it soaks up water to the point where it'll just crack and, and basically blow up. Um, I don't, so I don't use basswood and pass that around. Oh, and then I like to go to uh, uh, my, my stash, or in this case, I, I just went up to Joanne Bebo's cobweb, and I, I fished through her uh, little bowl of cufflinks there. And this fish is going to be a folk art walleye, so it's got these nice mother of pearl uh, cufflinks for eyes. So I use old stuff like that. Um, I use old tins like this, old... Uh, um, tobacco tin and I'll cut that up and make fins for my fish as well. Um, any questions about the making of a fish? You know obviously once all those pieces get in you get your weight covered up by putty, your eyes in and everything, then I'll paint it and then I'll seal it. Um, I use acrylics because they're naturally made to withstand water and then I'll spray it with like a clear coat that I just get at the hardware store. Were the old ones, were they particular about the wood? You know what the wood was that they used in the... Misra used almost always cedar. Um, to find his fish uh, now with these extremely narrow, fragile tails still intact is more and more difficult because um, they almost always split off. And that's due to the cedar. You know, it, it's uh, fragile, but uh, it uh, also is water resistant. So it, it's, it's nearly um, a perfect wood, I think, mean, for carbon decoys. Um, it smells nice when you're working with it. Um, it works easy if you have a sharp knife. Uh, it's plentiful, so if you mess up and it has to go in the fireplace, <laughs> you can get more, you know. Uh, I believe this this is an old one. I think this was cedar as well. Um, so, um, you know, other places they probably used a lot of what they had. Um, and you're, you're kind of quiet and you're watching, um, it's very, it can be very exciting because um, what happens is you have a long amount of time where you, you might have some minor activity going on. Um, you're jigging your, your fish around and it's making circles and you're sitting there with your spear waiting. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, a pike comes in. And they're, they really, you know, people call them wolves. 
of the water, you know, and you could get that sense that they really are hunting as they come into the hole in the winter time because you uh, you don't see that often when you're fishing. You know, you'll just find you have a pike on, or a pike has chased a smaller fish towards your boat, and you have this big weight on there, and then the battle's on, you know. But when you're looking down that hole, they creep in. <coughs> Sometimes, out of nowhere, like you looked over here, or you did, you know, inevitably that's what happens, is you checked your Polish, you know, to see if the water was hot enough, or whatever it was, and you look up, and there's a big fish in your hole, you know. Sometimes they'll come in really fast and angry and they'll, they'll smack your decoy or they'll bite it. Um, sometimes they'll just creep in, like inch by inch, mm -hmm. and you're waiting till you have a good shot. You know, and you want to kind of aim for the back of their, behind their head, somewhere where you're not going to mess up a lot of meat, somewhere where you're going to get them, you're not going to damage them, and they'll get away. Um, so, <laughs> no, which which kind they're doing? Yeah, they're probably most people out there are not spearfishing. Right. It's just it's not that popular. Um, but it seems it, like it would be much more popular. Well, it's much more exciting. I think people like catching, you know, um, and many people don't like northern, so. You know, you can't spear for walleye. So if they want to catch walleye or crappie or, you know. Um, I'll give you a, just a, a glimpse at, uh, Joey Zup is a good friend of mine. <coughs> he works up at uh, Zup's in the meat department. And uh, he's what I would call uh, pretty close to a, a master carver. He's well respected. All of his fish always look fantastic. They always swim better than anybody else's fish. <laughs> Uh, and he really is, he's a good friend of mine, he uh, helped me a lot to figure out how to make a fish swim right and uh, how to do things the right way. Um, and sometimes he and I will go out uh, together. He, uh, we, we got these spears uh, from a modern day spear maker. This is an idea about the times and uh, how sharp they are. Uh, this is a, a really nice spear. It's very lightweight. Um, things don't need to be heavy. Um, and if you have the right kind of spear, almost all you have to do is, is just get it in motion as it goes right through the water to your target. Uh, obviously, you've got a bent spear. Uh, you have one that's way too light or, or way too heavy. It's going to do different things in the water. You know, if you shoot into the water, uh, the trajectory of the bullet actually changes. Um, spearing. It's kind of, you're sitting there, and whether you lift up and go or just let her go, it's just sort of a fluid motion, and it really just glides through the water. Um, a lot of times, guys would make tine guards um, for their spear. Joey made this one out of a fish, and he, he carved and painted a, a northern on the handle here. So um, those, you know, spear makers, there's not a lot of those guys around anymore, and uh, but there are, there are modern day people that that make spears just like you know I make decoys. This is an example of an older, shorter spear, and uh, even now the tines on there are really sharp. So you have a lot of between your ice saw, uh, your chisel, your spear, your auger. They have a lot of sharp, dangerous implements that you're out there hauling around on the ice, you know. So you got to be so careful. Um, anybody know, uh, you know, the Staklasa family here in town? This is their uh, dad's jig, jig stick. Uh, as far as I know, I was told he made it. Um, and it's almost a perfect form. If you like antiques, it's really old, got a lot of patina to it. It fits right in your hand, but this is yeah. is almost a perfect the perfect size the just to be out there over your hole with some old string wrapped around it, uh, jigging. So even now, even uh, these things nowadays are becoming somewhat collectible. Um, I've got here a lot of those trout jigs. 
some metal jigs that the um, guys made for uh, for trout fishing. Um, one thing I've been doing is collecting old beat up lures and uh, for a long time people, these are called make-do decoys and people made um, decoys out of old creek chub lures like this and they just added their own fins. Um, that's pretty common to have an old lure that is all beat up and maybe you can't carve work very well but you can fit some fins in there and so they would make those. Um, you have decoys that have bent tails, tails that move like this. Um, this is one of my mine here. Um, I, as I said, one of the things kind of unique to Minnesota is um, that up here they make a lot of what's called critter decoys. Um, you know northern pike go for mice that fall in the water. They go for frogs, baby ducklings, all those kinds of things. So that led people to make fish decoys that didn't look like fish. Um, this is a scary frog. <laughs> he's got teeth. This is a frog that's, uh, he's, he could be used as a decoy or a lure. And uh, he has a metal tongue coming out. You know? So this lends itself to uh, all kinds of imaginative things. Um, some of my frogs, um, like this, I've got the feet and, and ta uh, the feet and legs out there at an angle. And uh, a actually a lot of thought goes into these kind of designs as far as how they're going to glide or swim in the water and, and getting this tiny little thing to be weighted just right so it just doesn't sink like a stone. Um, and uh, uh, when I met Nan and Jerry uh, as I guided them on a fishing trip um, a few years ago, uh, they bought a decoy from me, and then and Nan got a frog like this last year from me. So uh, we've got some collectors in the room here. And Aaron has quite a few of my decoys at his uh, shop here in town. Um, let's see. You know, I know we're talking mostly about this area, but did they use um, decoys to, to spear sturgeon? They did. Mm. And they okay. use, I, I have a sturgeon spear, it's uh, about this wide and about this long and the tines are about that big. Um, and, and they still spear sturgeon in, in Wisconsin. <coughs> um, you know, uh, it, it is one of the things where it's not as easy if you're, some states don't even allow you to go spear in their state. I don't know if I could get a, a sturgeon license in Wisconsin or not, I haven't looked at it, but um, they keep the population small that way and, and control their resources. Um, but yeah, the sturgeon are, can you imagine Native Americans? They got a sturgeon that was, you know, it could be two table lengths, easy, long, and big, and, and food for all winter, you know, or at least a couple months, whatever. and. Uh, that was a big deal. But that's how they got them, with spears. Um, you read, I read some old articles about that. Um, Tim, do you, do you, when you release a spear, do you usually get the fish? Is there a fraction problem? Or do you, you know, you I don't think that? refraction is a problem if you got the right equipment. Do um, you usually get the fish when you release it? I usually do. Um, the first fish I ever speared, I actually released. <laughs> kind of a funny story. Um, I was jigging, and uh, this, it, this almost, I think, um, more than any other sport, uh, it, timing is essential. So for uh, two or three years, I went out spearing it. Different times, whenever I could, different times of the year, early, late, different times of the day. Um, and quite frankly, the only fish I ever saw was a sucker. So I never got a chance. And um, this year, uh, I wanted to go early and my time, timing was just hideous. Uh, but I would get out to the shagro, I'd get everything set up, and no matter how I could do it, it would always be about 3.30. Well, by accident I found a pocket. And the pocket, really, that 
worked for me this year was 3.30 to 4.15. And uh, about uh, five minutes to four, I think that first time I wrote about it on my blog somewhere, um, <coughs> this fish came in. And I was so crazy excited it was a norther that it looked like it was like this big. You know? And uh, I threw my spear, and your spear hits the fish, and then usually you do this in shallow water, you know. So then the fish and the spear hit the water, and all you see is dirt. And um, you don't really know what's happened. And then uh, when you're spear fishing, uh, unless you like going to get a new spear every time, you tie the rope to your leg, you know, or somewhere in your house. Um, because once you throw it, it's gone. Then you got to pull it back up, especially if there's a fish on the other end. So I pull it up, and um, little guy was only about 16 inches long, you know. And so I could have, I could have kept it. But the funny thing was that the tines of the spear had gone right around the fish, like this. No, well, he's too thick. They, gone, they went right around the fish anyway. We oh, have a thin fish. You get the picture. He's in here like this. Yeah. Oh. Well, the end of the spear had stuck on a stick, <laughs> just like this. So he was kind of trapped here. He could have gotten away, but he was pinned by the stick that had gone like this on the bottom. So I took the stick off, stuck him down in the hole, and he just swam away. <laughs> so, Catch you right in. and then uh, about 10 minutes later, a big one came in, and I, I got my first fish. Um, but just so extremely exciting, because you don't want to miss. You see it there. Um, it's not like you feel anything on your line. or. And then you see this live swimming fish. Fins are going, uh, unless he's really aggressive, he could be barely moving. And he's watching your decoy, and you don't know what to do. You know, do I, do I jig it? Do I stop? Do I wait? You know, do I, do I need more of him in this hole? You know, you're looking down the hole. And so that, that was how that was. And then uh, we went the next day, and... Um, I think the next morning I took Lucy out and uh, we brought some snacks along. We got hungry and I'd just given her like her breakfast bar and I had mine and she's sitting in the corner with the decoy and I, you know, it was 10 seconds and I looked down and there's like a 36 inch monster coming in the <laughs> corner of the hole and I can't do anything about it and she doesn't know and she can't, I wanted her to see it because she would yet to see a fish. Um, and he he saw the decoy, and he was older, I guess, more experienced. I don't know. He came up to it and just went like that and was gone. So, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering how um, what's the range of depth that's effective? Like, do, I would imagine at some point you lose the speed with the spear or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think. Because people, as the season goes on, they'll move, they'll go to deeper water because the fish go there. Um, if you don't have to cut through too much ice, uh, you can just keep fishing. As long as your sight is that you can you know, see the fish, I think you have a pretty good shot. Um, I don't think, um, if, a, if you're in 30 feet of water and a fish is like down 25 feet, obviously then there's gonna be some trajectory issues with your spear. Um, <clears throat> most of the fish, like you also, uh, most people jig their decoys within uh, kind of a that 10 foot range. You know, you can go deeper than that, but then you start losing visibility and things like that too. Um, Do you use eggshells? I don't. Is that legal? I think it's legal. It's an old guide trick. Yeah. It's not, you know, it, it's biodegradable. Eggshells. Um, would obviously make the bottom more visible than anything that swam over the, the uh, eggshells you could see better. I'm going to start cycling through these or you won't see a bunch of them. My, my wife's uh, um, has fond memories of them yeah. going up. You know, uh, that reminded me of something. Oh, um, lakes do vary quite a bit in their visibility. 
Um, I've gone to Shagua on days where it's perfectly clear, like an aquarium, like I said. I've set up in exactly the same place as I was the day before, and I can't see my decoy in the <coughs> So there's things that move in the water and happen um, that you don't have any control over, and you just have to move, you know. Um, you might want to talk about the contest that you go to and oh. the, how they judge the lures and yeah. what the criteria are. There are different contests and different things that uh, carvers enter if you want. And um, oh, that, that's how I get inspiration, you know. I, there was a little tone in my hand there. <laughs> um, that's Joey Zup's frog. He does amazing work. Um, when you go to a contest, there are different uh, size uh, sections set up, and yeah, that's Dan and Jerry's fish right there. Um, your fish have to swim correctly. They have to be put together correctly. Pieces can't fall off of them. Um, there are folk art categories. There are realistic categories where people carve fish that look exactly like the real thing. Um, but they actually have tanks. And they'll take your fish and they'll swim it in a tank. And as judges, we'll judge which which fish swims better, which you know. Um, so this is Simon's first decoy here that he carved. One of the great things about this sport um, and about the art really is that uh, this is where I get ideas. Um, that I've been able to teach my kids about uh, a sport, about a collecting, about making something of their own, um, about the importance of doing things right, making it so it works, um, taking pride in, in a, a functional piece of art that's um, a little bit different than painting a picture or uh, making a drawing or uh, a piece of music, something like that, because it has some utilitarian value that you would go and use it for. Um, so, um, as a result, Simon and Lucy and Juliet have all uh, made their own fishing lures, they've all made their own fishing decoys, and uh, it's so fantastic that they made that I kind of want to keep forever, you know, or, you know, um, but they have a great gift, and what they usually do is they'll give it to their grandpa for Father's Day, for his birthday, or for Christmas, um, and that's where a lot of my stuff goes to. Uh, I swim and test them in my bathtub. <laughs> um, a lot of times I make fish in the winter and I don't have, I'm not going to go outside and fill up a pool or something, but everything gets swim tested. Um, I did say, I just want to make sure, but I, when we sent out the description, if anybody wanted to bring um, something that you wanted me to give a value to, I offered that opportunity. If you did, just see me afterwards. But this is uh, that fish won uh, first prize. That frog did. His, his legs kick up in the air, kind of like a real frog. That's the one you saw swimming in the in the bathtub. This is Simon's uh, second fish that he did. The first one was a frog, and he won a ribbon at that show. And this is Lucy. She won Best in Show uh, ribbon for her first fish that she did. And there they are. So, what does that say? 2007. So he's grown quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> are there regular shows? You know, there's about three or four a year. And, and depending, well, maybe, maybe five or six. Uh, there's one in Pearl, Minnesota. Uh, there's one in Michigan. There's one in uh, um, Park, uh, or by Detroit Lake, Park Rapids. Um, it really is just, it's a fun thing to do. I'm just cycling real quick here through stuff. I wanted to show you some shots of uh, actual fish before we got in. If anybody has questions, just shout them out. I hope this has been a fun little entertaining break. Yes, it's great. You know, yeah. it, it, the sky's the limit on what you can do. Now the camera makes this hole look really dark. It's not that dark. 
But this is my spear. I got a dragonfly made out of a clothespin and some recycled coffee tins down there. The dragonfly darts like this in water. There's a little frog I made. He, I got him so that he can swim in the circle. Um, and there's a trout. That's kind of the whole the view looking down, you know. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, no pictures of, of fish in the hole. Because I would be throwing my spear instead of taking a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Is it your semi submerged right there? Like, then uh -huh. sometimes I have the tips in the water. Sometimes you just get tired of, you know, holding it and you just have it on the ice a little bit. Do they need width? Do they need wings or. They need wings. wings because what a snake, a snake wouldn't work? Well, it would work somewhat, but the wings give it buoyancy mm -hmm. um, and also help how it uh, moves. These are just various steps of what one looks like. You know, lots of times I just draw a picture. I drew a picture um, when I was on vacation, and then when I got back, I started working on the shape. I wood burned into it, um, the details. It's got a spear and some old spots. Then I uh, primered the whole thing, covered up the, it looks a little weird in, in that shot because the Legs are all covered up with tape on the underneath because I wanted to preserve the, the old tin. I put a weight in it. Um, the cross is kind of a signature thing for me. It also happened that that's the best weight that you could do with some going out to the side. Um, I finished it with paint and then it looked a lot like the drawing that I did. Um, this is just, lots of times I end up with scrap wood and I, I just go with the shape, and then I end up with some kind of crazy looking dinosaur fish, you know. Okay, so this is, um, while we're doing this, it leads you to do other things. This is Simon's second uh, derby car, and he won coolest looking for that car. <laughs> but uh, by the time we got to that, this stage of after doing this, he had the skills to, uh, um, you know, wood burn his car to draw things to do different stuff, and we worked on that together. But um, every fish you do, you get a little bit better. These are old fish. That's another Minnesota fish there. Um, it's really cool to find a tackle box like this. Yeah. I mean, it's just you can, you know, you want to dig into it, but you want to wait and see what's there and, and uh, make it kind of drag it out. You know, <laughs> these are uh, little. Um, the old square clothespins, you know, um, mm -hmm. these are grasshoppers made out of square clothespins with uh, copper feet and coffee can uh, wings. There's another frog. There's a crazy looking perch. Uh, a lot, uh, tine guard I made. This turtle is pretty cool. I really like him. There's that fish again. Old, some old fish. Cedar, cedar still work after it's weathered, like driftwood? Yeah. People made uh, trout jigs out of bullets. Some of them here. Uh, sometimes I made this suic uh, lure. I found an old one and painted it for a friend of mine for a musky lure. Old spears are collectible. This is a wood burning on a, a frog. Um, every year I give Steve Paragas, uh, a lure or a decoy for Christmas, because it's his Christmas, Christmas is his birthday. Um, so he gets one gift. <laughs> <laughs> We're not required to give gifts. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> Still have your job. I want to remember that, Michelle. <laughs> no. uh, this is really cool, because this is one of two of Simon's drawings here. A lot of time I get my ideas for my kids. I mean, this is great. If I could figure out how to make a fish like that on the bottom with all those bumpy warts and stuff. I love that. You know, it, it just really cool. These are just things. So they uh, made fish out of copper. It was hollow inside and the weight, the water would go in and, and put the weight in it, you know. Um, well, this is my dad. Funny looking picture of him with our dog. There's Joey's up. There's uh, I wanted to show, put this in there because here's the tools of the trade. You know, you got your ice chisel. See how big that block of ice is? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this was a year, a year where we couldn't go early. This was uh, a few years ago where there was so much slush on Shagwa that it actually froze my permanent house in. And that's the last year I had a permanent I, I had a house. Question. I, I've never done this ice or spearing, but I've cut big holes uh, in the ice mostly to get my neighbor's pickup trucks back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I found it was much easier to push the ice down and under. And it, some, some that people do that. Screw up. You wouldn't get as much light through or anything like that? Or? I don't know about that. Um, if you're not going to go back, um, what we try to do is put the ice back in the hole. Oh, okay. And that way snowmobilers aren't going to go down your hole that night or something like that. No, I you got your ice tongs in the back there. There's my house that year. Pictures of me. Okay. There's uh, what it looks like down another hole. I know we're almost at, at 1 o'clock, so I'm going to go in here. <coughs> Craziness that I've created. You're doing nice. Well, I'm doing good. Look at the tines on this. I've been doing this since about 2000. The tines on this spear, yeah, I've got this for $2 at a garage sale. They're all bent over because somebody used it to spear for suckers. Believe it or not, uh, in mint condition, that's a $600 spear. Wow. Made by a, a really good spear maker. Obviously, that's not mint condition. Um, I'm gonna. I want to show you uh, pictures. Well, you got some results. <laughs> okay. I played hooky from church because Joey texted me. He said three big ones just went in my hole. So uh, I left early and I went out there as fast as I could to Shango with my decoys and I sat in his house and this is a picture of that. That was the first time this year um, that I, I really got out there and then uh, then I had the bug again. Um, there are the houses. There's me walking over there. Then here's uh, the first time I went on my own. I got the decoy down there and uh, there's the, the first fish I got. Uh, about 26 inches. Um, it was about 4.15 at this time. Um, really cool for me. He's, he's the northern pike. Do you, um, what, what do you call it, skin them or? Yeah. There, right there? No. The, oh. Take them home and clean them. Uh huh. Um, but they go home really easy because they're frozen. <laughs> you know, exactly. Uh, you just carry them home. But this is a beautiful night. You can yeah, see. look at that. I mean, just like other times when you're out in the woods or on the lake, this is the sunset. Mm. And all my stuff's packed up. I got my fish and I'm taking this picture. It's just amazing. Um, you go to other lakes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and usually nice lakes with clear water. There you can get the kind of green idea. Um, I've done uh, something that uh, serious collectors um, would probably not like very much. I put an actual collectible Mizra old fish, not this one, but another one, down the hole with my fish. And uh, Lucy was jigging one and I was jigging the other one, or, or Jen was with me doing that. I just wanted to see how his fish swam and if they brought the fish in. And most of his fish. Um, actually kind of wing through the water like this and they don't do a circle but they create a lot of erratic movement and they do bring fish in so there they are down the hole together and you're about to see here a couple pictures that just uh, for me make the whole thing worthwhile um, yeah. not not necessarily that one but that's cool he's on the kitchen table <laughs> at least I put him on paper so, there's there's second fish. There's Jed. Look how happy she is. She decoyed that one in. Wow. And then uh, this is the reason I 
This is the reason I did this. Yeah. Right here. Um, we we went a lot um, to try to get to, to this point, and then um, I think uh, this was the last time we went spearing this year. But uh, we got this one back in the tail. It was the day that you could see hardly anything at all in the water because the water was so cloudy. And Lucy and I both at the same time she was doing the jig and we're like, I go, look, there he is. And all you could see was the shadow. But I, I knew by the shape and I knew by the fins that it was a pike. It didn't have the white on the tail. I knew it wasn't a walleye. And in almost utter darkness, wham, and uh, pulled up the spear and there he was. So. He she helps was, to have a photogenic family too. She was ecstatic. Yeah. Well, they, they get that from their mother. <laughs> okay, so uh, you can see on this fish here uh, just how the weights, like I talked about, um, would fill in. The fins are into the weight. Um, and then over the top of that, they put wood putty, and we do that now. And so um, you really don't have lead leaching out into the water and things like that. So. Um, that's all I got for today. Thanks for coming. That was great.